so uh, sorry for the delay because uh, there was some uh, chairperson was not there so uh, we'll have the new person who will chair the session um, so uh, welcome all to the second session is everyone settled there okay so uh, the session is on uh, the cause and remedies for anxiety stress and depression today perspective from different medical discipline uh, so we'll start in a while uh, where you will see that uh, different uh, experts from different field will come and will tell about this topic uh, so uh, in this session uh, you will hear about uh, this perspective of the remedy the cause and the remedy for anxiety stress from i think from tibetan perspective i think we have one speaker from uh, ayurveda and uh, one would be uh, the the modern the western medicine that we have uh, uh, so this uh, i think for people who have attended uh, I, i think uh, this mensi khan workshop which happened which generally happens you know every year there is there so there was the first time heard about this different disciplines coming together and different people from different discipline talking about stress and anxiety there uh, so we'll start in a while so the chairperson for this session would be dr nivedita uh she'll be here at some moment she has come hello so if i pronounce it as chalil right okay uh so Dr. Nivedita Chalil, uh, she completed her PhD from Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai, and is a mental health professional with over two decades of experience. She has an academic background which includes occupational therapy, counseling, psychiatric, social work, arts-based therapy, and Buddhist psychology. Currently, she runs. ARTH which is a mental health initiative in Mumbai and offers a course in applied buddhist psychology in two cities that is Mumbai and Chennai her presentation healing ADD in uh, today's youth it is i think attention deficit attention deficit uh, deficit disorder in today's youth the view of the practitioner draws from her experiences in the field and her perceived need for reflective practice now i hand over the mic to dr nivedita who will introduce the speakers and uh, will, the, the mic is here Good afternoon everyone. How was lunch? Lunch was good. Okay, I'm stepping in to fill in for Mr. Yash Dhamija. So please excuse the delay and some amount of confusion. Um this panel is really talking about the cause and remedies for anxiety, stress and depression. And is there anybody here who doesn't feel these topics are relevant? not really the idea of recognizing how much stress anxiety depression has become almost pervasive to the point that when we conduct stress anxiety workshops one of the first few things we ask people to do is to count our breath per minute how many times are we breathing and most of the time we recognize that most people who don't define themselves as being anxious are still having very high breath rates which for us is actually an indicator of some amount of stress and anxiety um so it gives me great pleasure that we have a panel here today that's going to bring in different perspectives and hopefully it will add value to each of us and be something that we can take back 
I'd like to invite the first speaker, Dr. Tenzin Nima, who has studied traditional Tibetan medicine from the Mensi Khang in Dharamsala. He was appointed as a member of a team entrusted with translating the Gyushi into English. Currently, he is a chief medical officer at Mujnukatila branch in Delhi. And besides doing regular clinical practices, Dr. Nima writes on Tibetan medicine and also provides health talks. Can we have Dr. Tenzin Nima here, please? Would you like to sit on this side? They can't see yeah, you. It's okay. You sure? Yeah. I have to use this. Ah, okay. I can use this. No. So you have you need about twenty minutes? Yeah. Okay, I'll tell you. No. the leg and good afternoon to everybody. First of all, uh, I would like to ex express my heartfelt gratitude to Geshe Dujdandula, the director of Tibet House, for inviting us in this uh, wonderful event, Legacy of Tibet. So uh, it's, my, it's my honor and privilege to have you today. So before going to the actual topic, uh, I would like to briefly uh, explain about the OV or Tibetan medicines. It is a medical system that has developed and originated like other indigenous medical system. So uh, before Buddhism came to Tibet, Tibet had its own indigenous medical system, that is Shangshun Pun medical tradition. During that time, shamanism was widely practiced as a healing system. And it is perhaps the <clears throat> most oldest medical system from both academic and practical point of view. And Tibetan medicine enjoys an unbroken practice over 5,000 years ago. It is a medical system that is blended with medical science and Buddhist philosophies. So during the time of uh, 8th century uh, Gyushi, the fundamental text of Tibetan medicine was composed, and later in 12th century, uh, it was revised and re-edited by New Yuto Yenjo Gombo. And he synthesized and blended uh, Buddhist philosophies into our fundamental medical text. And therefore, it cares mental, physical, and emotional health. Uh, this 8th century medical text, the Gyushi, it already identifies 20 types of diabetes, hyperglycemia, and 18 types of cancer, which is very common in today's world. Uh, it is a system that explains about the physiology of memory, mind, mental channels, and lung disorder, which is roughly translated as wind disorder. So this, this way related to, to the, today's topic. And the fundamental concept of Tibetan medicine is uh, our body is made through the four elements, and the disease are also uh, made through four elements. And remedies in the form of medicine, food, or beverages that are, that are also made through four elements. Therefore, our body, disease, and remedies are all interconnected by same nature of the four elements. Here I exclude uh, space elements because space element is not a material element. It's, it doesn't have any functional role in our system. And therefore, the manipulation of Mother Nature is equally manipulating you. So we are all, always connected to our Mother Nature through food, water, air, and perceptions. So one of the main uh, core teaching of this medical system is staying and living in harmony with Mother Nature. So this briefly about the overview of Tibetan medicines. Now I would like to discuss a little bit about the three principal energies which is equivalent to uh, three dosh in Ayurveda. So three principal energies are lung, tipa, and pagan, which is roughly translated as lung as wind energy, tipa as a bile energy, and pagan as a flame energy in our system. So these three principal inherent energies are called nyebasum. So nyeba, that literally means uh, defects. So it, it is uh, like fault. 
So these three, because these three principal energies, uh, which present inherently in our system, they carry within them the inherent defects in destroying our body at the ultimate stage. Therefore, uh, it is called nevasum, the three fault or three defects. So when we talk about lung energy, it is the manifestation of air element and it is a movement. The lung actually means movement and mobile. So any actions or activities which is uh, connected to body, mind and speech is called lung or wind energy. Like uh, all the neurological activities, voluntary or involuntary movements, everything is connected to lung energy. It's a dynamic energy in our system. And the most important uh, function of this energy is it regulates the function of our mind and mental functions. So whether it's stress, depression, or anxiety, all are connected to the imbalance of lung energy, which is called wind energy in our system. So second energy is a deeper energy, which is the manifestation of fire element in our system. It is actually the heat energy of our system. All the metabolic activities in our system is associated with the deeper energy. And it gives us courage, intelligence, and the sharpness of mind and memory. So when when chibo energy is disturbed, we we get we will get the problem like hyperthyroidism, where our body system burns itself. And the third energy is the packing energy, that is the uh, manifestation of earth earth and water element in our system, and it is fluid system of our body, and it is a sticky in nature. So therefore, we call it sticky energy. And it gives us, uh, it nurtures and nourish our system. And it is responsible for the tolerance, patience, and stability of our mind. So these three are the principal energies which we need to understand. Now, uh, I would like to discuss about the understanding of the root cause of the disease. So when we have sickness, when we have disease, or suffering, uh, usually we try to we try to address more on the superficial level of the causes and factors like wrong diet and lifestyle. But according to Tibetan medicine, it is very important to understand and analyze the root cause of disease, which is always there in our system. So when it, when it just look into the root cause of disease, there's always ignorance which is the fundamental cause of all the disease, the root cause of all the disease. So ignorance, out of ignorance, we have, we generate you know, egoistic feeling, uh, self-centered attitude, and we do a lot of mistakes through, my, through body, mind, and uh, verbally. And uh, out of ignorance, we do a lot of negative activities through body, mind, and speech. So ignorance gives rise to these three mental poisons three afflictive emotion, which is the specific cause of all the disease. So according to Tibetan medicine and Buddhism, these three afflictive emotions are the base of our mind. And of course we have knowledge and wisdom, but these three mental poison uh, are made by our mind. So, and we have these three principal energies, which is the recent cause of all the disease. So these uh, three principal energies based on five elements and these three afflictive emotions, when they work together, when they are in harmony, we have a state of uh, perfect health or state of equilibrium. And at uh, the moment, they are disturbed through the four, uh, four causatic factors like wrong diet, wrong lifestyle, uh, seasonal changes, and mental factor. These uh, four causative factors will influence to the uh, balance of these uh, afflictive emotions and the three, mental, the three principal energies. Then we have uh, imbalances in our system. That is called disease or suffering. So understanding of this root cause is very important to, um, <clears throat> to challenge the suffering and disease. <laughs> and uh, according, according to Tibetan medicine, the heart is very important uh, organs in our system where our consciousness, mind, or subtle lung, subtle wind energy resides in the system. So according to Tibetan medicine, it says that 
That means metaphorically, heart is like a king because it controls and regulates our uh, mind-body system. And uh, it is the base of life, base of our memory. And we, we can see here that mind and mental channels, when you look into the heart, we have these uh, six kind of consciousness or mind, uh, the sensory mind here. So all the consciousness uh, are based on in the heart and therefore heart is called the base of sensory organs and through this sense, uh, these channels uh, and uh, it says that we have over 500 uh, sub channels associated with these channels which are primarily responsible for the clarity of mind and development of the mental consciousness so heart is actually a very important organ so, and <clears throat> In the heart, we have life-sustaining loom, which is a subtle wind energy, which is always associated with mind. And according to Tibetan medicine, mind and loom are inseparable. So if there's no, uh, no wind energy, mind can't flow into our system. So they are inseparable, and we have a particular term called lung sem yerme. That is, uh, they are inseparable, and mind itself is the nature of lung. So this uh, subtle life sustaining is the purest, uh, purest form of lung in our system, purest form of wind energy in our system that carries mind inside our mind-body system. And it is the mother of all the lung. And it, it gives rise to 10 types of lung energy, the wind energy in our system. So out of that, five major lung is mainly associated with heart and mental function and physical activities. And five minor lung that is mainly associated with sensory organs in the, in the brain. So these uh, 10 types of uh, lung energy are very highly responsible to function our mind and body system. And now, what is stress in Tibetan medicines? So when we, when we just uh, heard about the stress, we usually think about the mental stress only. But as far as Tibetan medicine is concerned, uh, we always talk about the three types of stress. That is physical stress, mental stress, and verbal stress. And we usually talk about the misuse, disuse, and overuse of our mind-body uh, system. You know, so if you if you uh, if you engage in all all activities of our uh, mental function, it is considered as mental stress. And for example, uh, if we if we can lift up uh, 10 kg of uh, 10 kgs, and if you try to lift uh, 50 kgs, that is the physical stress. And the same way, if you try to, uh, like one piece of uh, pizza is very tasty for us, but if you try to eat three pizzas, that is the stress for your digestive system. So in this way, stress can be physical, verbal, and mental stress. So stress is usually it is associated with uh, imbalance of lung energy. It is associated with the uh, increasing of the lung energy. And anxiety and depression are associated mainly with the mind and mental energy. So, and this stress, anxiety, and depression, if they exist in our system for a short period of time, that is uh, usually the uh, superficial level of lung imbalances in our system. And when this, <clears throat> when this stress, anxiety, and depression, if they, uh, if they exist for more than three months, six months, then it becomes chronic in our system. And the effect of this stress, anxiety, and depression, it just imbue in, into our system. It penetrates into our system. And it finally, it leads to chronic depressions like that and uh, psychiatric disorders. So we need to uh, manage before it uh, goes into a chronic stage. And now, impact and areas, areas of influences of stress, anxiety, and depression in our mind-body constitutions. So, according to Tibetan medicines, every individual is uh, different. Every individual has different identity. Uh, some some indiv individuals are very stressful and emotional in nature. Some people are very... Uh, 
aggressive and intelligent in nature and some people are very uh, stable and calm in nature so based on these mind body constitutions uh, there's different impacts and influence in our system so if we have too much restlessness insomnia the feeling of emptiness panic difficulty in breathing laughing crying at in inappropriate time these presentations are associated with dynamic energy of our system that is uh, connected to the long type of mind body constitutions why you in ayurveda they say why you energy and these symptoms affects to our heart thyroid and brain and if we have symptoms like aggressive behavior sleeplessness sleep, sleeplessness at night anger wanting to nap desiring for cold foods and drinks these symptoms are mainly associated with transformation energy of our system that is connected to the deeper type of mind body constitution that is in ayurveda they say pitta and these symptoms will impact and uh, influence to our liver and gallbladder and blood systems and if we have symptoms like uh, wanting to stay alone quiet and sleepy drowsiness lethargic and feeling of heaviness and loss of appetite these is, these symptoms are mainly associated with uh, pekin type of mind body constitution that is the sticky energy of our system and it affects to our the function of kidney stomach and respiratory system like asthmatic problems so these are the influences and impacts of stress anxiety and depression in our system based on mind body constitutions yeah so now we we'll talk a little bit about the memory and the supreme energy in our system so usually if our mind is instable if you are too much worry anxious then our focus memory mindfulness everything goes down so this is usually faced by a very stressful person who is very depressive and in the same way Tibetan medicine talk about uh, supreme essence which is the uh, which is associated with uh, radiance and it gives radiance nourish and nurture our system it gives psychological confidence and plays a defensive role in our mind body system so these essence the supreme essence always support our mind so if we if this supreme essence exhausts in our system then we are susceptible to uh, so many psychological disorder and the patient become very weak fragile and depressions and they uh, they lost radiance so the, this uh, when this uh, supreme essence is enough in our system then we reflect some uh, radiance in our face and forehead so this is this is uh, something like immune system in our mind body system so now what causes this uh, stress anxiety depressions so the main causes is the weak mental strength and immunity and sorrow and grief so if you persistently do sorrow and grief uh, for our uh, loss of our family dear one and near one then we are susceptible to have these stress anxiety and depressions and sadness and loneliness unhappiness mental strain due to anxiety and stress unwholesome diet and lifestyle in influence of evil spirit inadequate sleep so it, this sleep is actually very important to balance our lung energy the wind system of our uh, body so if there is inadequate sleep then it, it aggravates the wind energy and then disturb our mind so which is the main cause of stress anxiety and depressions and improper diet if you always rely on uh, non oily foods uh if always de uh, depend on the uh, fast foods then we are susceptible to uh, disturb our wind energy that is the main cause and committing non-virtuous activities 
disturbance of principal energy. So these factors will lead to uh, block our uh, mind and mental system and the wind energy in our system, which is mainly associated in the heart. So then ultimately, uh, we, uh, it will lead to stress, depression, and uh, some uh, psychiatric disorders. So we need to uh, control these uh, causes and conditions. And if we have persistently engaged in mental grief and sorrow, we have symptoms like recalling of loss, once dear one. And not only that, uh, these people will speak frequently about the, their lost one. And loss of sleep, they have usually insomnia problem, and they have pale complexions. They are very weak and you know looks very dark. So this is uh, this reflects that they have some deep sorrow and uh, grief inside their mind. And uh, affecting, of, affecting on the susceptibility and vulnerability of the uh, various body systems. So we have various, various symptoms on the basis of susceptibility and vulnerability. So it, it doesn't uh, necessarily mean that everybody has this, all these symptoms. Uh, according to Tibet medicine, it says that uh, whichever system is weak in you, whichever system is susceptible in you, uh, that system will show uh, some pro problems and presentations. So, for example, if your menstrual system is weak, then it will show symptoms like dysmenorrhea, amenorrhea, and if your uh, digestive system is weak, or susceptible in you, then it shows uh, nausea and weak digestions. So in this way, uh, whichever system is weak in you, your stress, anxiety, and depression will affect on that system. So this is very, I think, very significant. Yeah. Okay. Time. So thank you so much. Do you want to talk a little more? Yeah. I would, uh, yeah, I would briefly uh, talk about the uh, treatment measures, which I think is interesting. So, uh, according to Tibetan medical systems, we usually design uh, four types of treatment. That is diet, lifestyle, medicine, and external therapies. So. <clears throat> Since this, uh, the concerned patient is more affected by stress, anxiety, and depression, that is associated with lung energy, the imbalances of the wind energy in our system. So we usually apply uh, those treatments which is connected to lung. But lung can be associated with both uh, tipa and taken, that is uh, heat energy and cold energy. But most of the time, it is uh, connected to lung disorder. So our treatment is based on the tests and qualities. So tests like sweet tests like molasses, uh, sour tests like venical, and salty, salty tests like salt. These are the three types of sweet uh, tests which will help to pacify the lung energy, the disturbance of lung energy. So if your mind is very <laughs> unstable and we are very anxiety and depressed, then you are advised to take these three types of tests, which is helpful to balance your uh, wind, disturbance of wind energy. And the quality of food like oily food, fats, oil, uh, heavy in food like uh, sweet potato, warm like uh, warm milk and soup. These are the important foods which needs to take by the uh, this, uh, this uh, depressive and uh, uh, stressful persons. So when we talk about uh, these uh, diet and drinks, in the grain item, uh, our own grains, that is uh, like uh, it, sh it just shows in the uh, here, like those uh, have the uh, bristles in that, like rice, barley, and we have lancet, sesame, cooked greens, these are very helpful. And milk products like sheep, D is a, a female yak in Tibet, and age all butter, warm milk, and all other are acceptable. The vegetables like cooked carrot, garlic, onion, chives, uh, green, green beans, sweets, potato, rice, turnip, all are very helpful. And oil, Sesame oil is best for the uh, all these uh, problems. 
Whether it's stress, anxiety, or depression, it is mainly associated with the disturbance of the wind energy in our system. So, according to Tibetan medicine, medical science, uh, sesame oil is best for all these issues. And uh, drinks like boiled milk, mild alcohol is acceptable and uh, uh, made by grains and molasses, green, uh, ginger tea, warm soups are very helpful. So as long as uh, uh, dietary, uh, the lifestyle is concerned, uh, we say that the, these affected, uh, uh, those persons who are affected by the stress, enzyme, depression, they are advised to stay in a warm, cozy and uh, dark place or dim place because if you expose to cold and windy, that will aggravate the lung energy, which will disturb your mind and mental functions. And uh, they should be always accompanied with loved ones, their uh, favorite uh, friends or uh, family members. So if they, if they are accompanied with some uh, <clears throat> those who are not uh, that much uh, uh, associated with them, then that is not helpful. So they are advised to stay with good friends, good company all the time. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tenzin Nima. Clearly, so much of knowledge. Maybe we can take this during the question answer round. You all could probably ask some more questions at that stage. Thank you very much, Dr. Nima. Thank you. We'll finish with the talks and then we will have a question answer round at the end. Uh, I apologize for the limited amount of time. Clearly when there's so much depth of knowledge and experience, 20 minutes feels inadequate. I'd like to call. Yes. Yeah, so this, I want to show you some of the therapies if you have time. Uh, can you do this during the question answer? Yeah, yeah. Because otherwise the other speakers okay. may not. Yeah. Yes. I'm just afraid we may not do justice to the other speakers who are waiting already. But I'm sure what we'll do is in the question answer round, maybe we can start with this. Would that be all right? It's just a matter of one minute. Just one minute. Just please. Please. <laughs> please. Yeah. Yes. This is a golden needle therapy. It's very hard. Thanks. And when meditating massage based on the you know, points and this is a cupping therapy very helpful for the blockage of our wind energy and some some of the healing therapies we use uh, incense the aromatic therapies which is very helpful for insomnia especially and wearing of amulets is very helpful mandar recitations rites and rituals Meditation on mindfulness is uh, very helpful and uh, bodhicitta cultivation and if you in, t in Tibetan tradition we receive initiations and uh, and from and yoga practice also helpful. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Nima, that was yeah. very illuminating. Um, and the imbalance of lung energy. I'm sure we're going to have a lot of questions for you at the end. <laughs> okay. May I invite Dr. Suresh Gupta? Uh, Dr. Gupta is a senior consultant and professor of pediatrics in the Division of Pediatric Emergency Medicine and Intensive Care, uh, Institute of Child Health, Sagandaram Hospital, and Gripma in Delhi. He's also the director of Pediatric Emergency and Acute Care Fellowship. He has more than 20 years of experience with pediatrics, pediatric emergencies, and intensive care. Runs the pro He's also the program director of the Pediatric Emergency Fellowship, teaching faculty for DNB, FNB, and pediatric emergency. We're very happy to have Dr. Gupta with us. Thank you. Dr. Gupta, can I give you a reminder about five minutes? Uh, first of all, it's really pleasure that uh, the house and Geshla has given this opportunity to share this platform with all the other disciplines. 
and understand how they understand stress and manage the stress. Being a emergency physician, I see lots of stress, not only in the person who is deceased, but also people who are not deceased but accompanying the person. So I'll try to focus on stress, anxiety and depression, how the modern medicine understands it. So what is this stress, how it happens, how it affects us and how we deal with it as per so-called modern science. I think stress is a day-to-day -day experience and anyone will say that I am stressed when they encounter a situation which is challenging, frightening or difficult. Right? And these are up and downs of life which most of the time we are able to tolerate without really disturbing our homeostasis. And not all stress is considered to be bad actually in modern medicine. Some amount of stress is considered to be good and that is called use stress. And this is what pushes us in life to do something, to achieve something in our life. But if this stress becomes persistent or severe, then it starts affecting our body and mind. Stress, anxiety, depression, and they are different mental states. And this anxiety and depression can start from the stress. Anxiety, we say, is a persistent, persistent worry even when the stress factor has gone away. And same way you can say low mood is when actually there is no reason for low mood but you feel low mood. To some extent these are accepted as normal but when they go beyond certain extent they start affecting us. And when they have crossed our limit we consider them, them that they have become disease. And now we call them stress disorder, anxiety disorder, depressive disorder. This disorder part, whether stress, anxiety or depression, you can correlate something with uh, suffering of suffering as per Buddhist psychology. And the stress, anxiety, depression or depressed mood, the day-to-day -day variation which you go in this thing, we can say it's something like suffering on change which all of us feel. But even when there is no stress, no anxiety, no low mood in our us, there is some background kind of longing or desire which is going on. We are looking for something, we are trying to achieve something, to reach there we don't know. Right? So this you can equate somewhat with what we call all pervasive suffering in Buddhist psychology. To understand any problem, what to manage any problem, Generally, there is a philosophy behind that, actually. How we understand that problem. This biomedical model or biomedical philosophy was the initial model of philosophy of understanding disease and health in modern medicine. It started way back in early 19th century, where the body was considered to be a passive thing, and everything what happens to the body is external. It makes diseases, bacteria, viruses, heat, cold, deprivation, whatever it is. This was the model. And to some extent, human, mankind tried to control all these factors and infection started coming down. But the new diseases started emerging. Heart attack, blood pressure, anxiety, depression. So people thought, this biomedical philosophy is not sufficient to explain the things. And the health philosopher started thinking there is a more to health rather than just external factor. And this biopsychosocial model or philosophy came into existence at the beginning of the 20th century where the disease is considered to be your health is considered to be an interaction between individual biology, psychology 
and even social factors, day-to-day -day interaction with the other individual and the society. And it worked very well, likely. Right? And most of the current medical treatment is based on this philosophy nowadays. But there is a caveat in this. This modern medicine of biopsychosocial model to treat the diseases is so expensive that a large part of our community or society cannot afford it and they are still suffering. So there is a need to think beyond the psychosocial model. And a new kind of philosophy is emerging in modern medicine, which still, I will say, is an initial stage, but a thought process has at least started. And this is what we call humanistic medicine. And this is, has started just in the beginning of the 21st century. And that relationship between stress and disease is well known. Right? So how this stress process works? When there is some event, whether it is external or internal, as a subject, I make some cognitive appraisal to that. And if I find that event to be threatening or challenging or overwhelming, it becomes a stressful event. And my body and mind starts responding to that at different level at emotional level, at physiological level, physical function of the body, and the way we act and behave in society and day-to-day -day behavior level. Modern science feels that whenever there is stress, we have got an inherent fight and flight response to that actually. Right? which is to save us. When there is a strong stress over there, I want to save myself. So either I should fight it out or should fly away. Right? And the body, mind will release lots of hormones, normal, lots of chemicals, which gives a mental strength for that particular moment and physical strength to get away with the stress. But when the stress is persistent, right? Right? The body slowly, slowly starts giving away. Our neurochemicals, hormones get stressed out and ultimately leading to absorption and failure of all the defense mechanisms and disease. There are various kinds of emotions can arise because of stress. Mostly it is negative, right? But some of the people, in spite of stress, are able to generate positive emotions and they create a new kind of thing in this society. And the major factor for creating a new thing is what stress. So it depends on individual. Physically, it can affect all part of the body. It can affect our heart. It can affect our digestive system, as Dr. Tenjin told us. It can affect our skin, it can affect our respiration, and importantly, our immune system. We start getting more infection, more diseases. And ultimately, it is all reflected in our behavior. Right? Our ability to perform as a person either professionally or as a family person or as a social person starts declining. So why it happens actually? External factors are there technically social, cultural, environmental, professional, what is expected out of her and what is really there outside and their internal causes. And as Geshla always teaches in his class, that external causes or factors are innumerable. You cannot control them. This is the internal causes which is in your hand. External causes to some extent you can modify. But external internal causes are in your hand. That is biology and psych 
psychologist they will try to focus ourselves on this aspect of uh, causation one of the belief which we modern scientist or modern medicine has that is all gene which is controlled a major part of diseases is controlled by gene this gene decides that during a stressful situation what neurotransmitters our or hormones our body is going to release and those neurotransmitters or neurochemicals affect our brain function and neuron and make us to respond mentally and physically the way we respond either in the form of stress anxiety or depression so this is one of the theory or philosophy in which most of the modern medicine physicians believe but in addition to this right people believe in modern science it's not only gene it's much more than that it's a behavioral response a individual when he's faced with a negative event he will got a irrational belief he is going to have negative emotions and these are going to be unhealthy but on the other hand another individual faced with the same situation but have rational belief rational thinking he may have negative emotions but healthy he will take those in a positive manner so why it is so that some people have irrational thinking and some people have rational thinking right this is has been searched in psychology and dr nivedita is expert in that so i'll just give a glimpse of it detail she can always answer on that right uh, psychologists and modern science believe that all of us are born with the inherent desire of self actualization and what is this self actualization to reach our potential what we want to be and what we want to be is not a fixed thing in life it changes from time to time its actualization of a child is different when it becomes teen it's different when it becomes adult it's different when it becomes old it's different and this keeps on changing but to achieve the self actualization we have to be fully functional and what do you mean by fully functional over here is that we should be as an individual open to all kind of experiences whether it's negative or positive we accept that existential living trust our feeling whatever way we are not to get influenced too much by the society allowing us some kind of creativity and feel a fulfilled life but when this person will have this fully functional all of us want to be fully functional and this fully functional a person will become only if during childhood a child gets a full respect for what he is right empathy and genuineness in day to day transaction right in which sector matters but this social factors during childhood to a great extent decides how an individual will behave when it comes to a stressful situation when it comes to a stressful situation the way i behave depend on the way i experience that event and this experience is very very individual you cannot feel that way the way i experience this thing so i am the best way to know myself frankly frankly speaking then how to know this yourself frankly this carl rogers self theory dr nivetha will agree me which most of the psychologist and skeptics believe that it works it says that there is self image there is the ideal self and there is the true self 
true self, you will say in gross way, the actual attribute I have. I'm fair, it's fine. I'm tall, it's fine. I'm angry person, it's fine. That's the actual self, or true self, you can say. The way my self-image is about me. Though I am good, but I feel I am bad. That's a self-image. Or I am bad, but I feel I am good. Right? Ideal self. The person you want to be. Right? You want to become an actor and you don't know the acting. Right? So your self-image at ideal true self is very different from ideal self. The far you are from ideal self, your self-image and true self, far from ideal self, more stress you will feel in your life. More congruence is there between the self-image, true self and ideal self, less tension you will feel. And I will just little add one more perspective to this. We can add one more thing from Buddhist psychologist over here. That is the ultimate self. True self here is a physical attributes or mental attributes or conventional attributes. Those who are doing psychology, Buddhist psychologist, Dr. Nivita will agree with me. The true self or selfness of a person actually. Right, which is not included in this theory. But if you add that factor, fourth factor, what is the real self as per Buddhist psychology, we'll be able to take care of most of the stresses in our life. So all these factors decide the way the person is going to think, the way the person is going to in interpret the environment and behavior, and this interaction ultimately decides everything. All of us agree that stress is a part of everyday experience. On one hand, it can promote little growth and competency, but in most of the situation is persisting, it is really harming. How to deal with it? Adaptive coping strategies, like it set a realistic goal, exercise regularly, as Dr. Tanjin told us, Eat healthy, sleep well, maintain balance in your life, positive, uh, reframing, optimism, enhance social support. And these factors add a resilience in your life. Altruism of Bodhicitta, as we call in Buddhist psychology, have positive role model, optimism, humor. And avoid all this maladaptive coping strategies like we try to withdraw ourselves from when there is stress or have negative attitude like anger, violence, resentment. Right. So all these strategies deal with the stress. I think even the stressed people know actually what they should do. Right? It's not that the alcoholic knows that alcohol is bad actually. He should leave it. But he's not about to leave it. So just saying is very easy actually. So how to go about it, how to inculcate these things as a our personality trait. And here comes the role of our psychologist, right? Cognitive behavior therapy, right? It's a talk therapy where the psychologist try to make changes in the thinking pattern, cognitive pattern, emotional pattern of the person and to make him understand how to respond to the stressful situation. And when these things fail sadly, sometimes we resort to pharmacotherapy and the focus of pharmacotherapy is uh, to change the neurotransmitter in the brain actually. But ultimately that is a temporary thing. We have to focus on this thing. And I'll finish. This is my own thought process. Many of my colleagues in modern science may not agree with it actually. Modern science, I think, is not a health science. This is a disease science. Because most of us come in contact with modern science when we are diseased actually. Not when we are healthy. Right? So, yes, it will take care of suffering of suffering. Right? Right? 
but yoga i think next speaker is from ayurveda right i have some idea about it i will not say keep much idea about it that i think is a real science is a vector health science because that you approach not only when diseased you approach yoga even when you are healthy free from diseases right so that i will say is a true health science and that will help you in taking care of suffering or change and buddhist philosophy Not the Tibetan medicine, but this flows. Tibetan medicine is a part of this flows or with this part, right? That I consider the ultimate science. When you understand it and realize it, it will take you away from all suffering and non-suffering, pervasive suffering. I will give a rest to my voice with this last. I have sorry, taken one minute extra. With this last thought, which I firmly believe. when analyzing any knowledge said by the buddha thank you so much for listening patiently to me and giving this opportunity to share this knowledge with all of you i know my knowledge is limited but thank you so much thank you very much dr gupta such a comprehensive uh, presentation where you discussed so many different aspects and approaches and most importantly the links between buddhist psychology and modern sciences has been and allopathy has been quite tremendously insightful thank you very much you. i'd like to invite dr deepika gunwant She is a senior consultant Ayurveda in Max Hospital Delhi with a rich and wide experience of more than 3 decades ranging from research clinical teaching operations marketing and regulatory aspects she has lectured extensively and conducted programs in Europe on various subjects of Ayurveda and has a number of international articles to her credit and is the co-author of the book entitled The Complete Illustrated Guide to Ayurveda I give you Dr Deepika gentlemen and good afternoon dr nivedita um i'm really very thankful to the organizers for inviting me over and it gives me an immense pleasure to be part of this uh, legacy of tibet 3 day festival and um, the topic is very interesting and um, i must tell you ayurved tibetan medicine yunani medicine all these systems of medicine have a lot to offer if you're talking about mental disorders now due to paucity of time i think i should straight away get on to my presentation and then just take you through i may skip a couple of slides please pardon me for that because nivedita has already told me there is time coming on the left side of the screen so i'll keep track of that okay. it's okay no no fine um so my presentation will go something like this uh, i'll just introduce you to what ayurveda is most of you in this room would be knowing what it means and what it stands for and then some of the basic concepts that ayurveda works around uh then a bit on health then about panchkarma and rasayan uh, and uh, we had something dr gupta just mentioned that um, somebody who is an alcoholic he knows that he is not supposed to take alcohol but how does he do it how do we do the hand holding for him so panchkarma and rasayan is something that does this and it's a very interesting concept then we'll talk about a little about the diet which is actually very personalized so even if we look at it at various books that are there available in the market on ayurveda talking about general diet and so is my book but i'll tell you frankly it's all very personalized so we'll have to take it at 
as you come and talk to us and then we tell you what is right for you and what is not right for you and therefore the comprehensive approach. Uh, Ayurveda sans is a Sanskrit word and it has got two words in it, Ayu and Veda. Ayu stands for life and Veda is knowledge. So it encompasses everything, the day you are born and the day you die, everything. So it's about life. It's not about when you get diseased or we have a pathological condition or you have problems. It's not that. It's all about life. And the emphasis has always been on promotion and protection of health in healthy individuals and treatment of diseases in the afflicted. That's been the real concept. Ashtanga Ayurveda, uh, Dr. Gupta spoke about Ashtanga Yoga, but uh, Ayurveda has got eight specialities. And the reason why I thought I should talk about this is because when you're talking about mental problems, um, which is the last one, Manas Rog Psychiatry, that's a speciality in Ayurveda, but I'm highlighted Rasayan and Vajikaran. I'm not highlighted Manas Rog because let's all stay positive. The treatment part, which is the Rasayan and Vajikaran, that is mainly used to treat mental disorders. And that's why I've highlighted the positive. The books on Ayurveda, uh, a little on that. Um, our main book on internal medicine is Charak Samhita, which was written in the 5th century BC, long, long ago, and uh, based on their empirical understanding, observations, there was no lab available, no scientific equipment available. So you can imagine what is written there is being explained now in the 21st century with a scientific view. but. It was already said there. There are lots and lots of examples which I share with uh, when I give my speeches. Uh, you see the first chapter in Sutrasthan. Now there are chapters in, there are um, eight uh, sections. And in this section, that's the first uh, section, which is Sutrasthan. The first chapter starts with Dirga Jivati Adhyay, which is the chapter on longevity. So you can imagine how important it is to lead a good, healthy, long life. And that's why it's called Dirga Jivati Adhyay. Many of you would know Sanskrit, so you would understand. And again, when you look at Chikitsa Sthan, which is the section which deals with treatment of diseases, the first chapter starts with Rasayan and Vajikaran. That means, and today the world is acknowledging that it, most of the diseases are because of lack of immunity. There is very low immunity. Recently, I just read an article where they are going to do clinical studies on an Ayurvedic herb in United Kingdom just to counter the antibiotics because a lot of antibiotic resistance, a lot of antibiotic related problems. So people are walking out of it. So they are looking at alternative things to remedy common cold. You use antibiotics which is not to be used. So these are the type of research works that are happening. So we should be very happy about it that these things are happening now. Now when we talk about life, just to add humor to the presentation, I just thought I'll tell you. We all, when we ask about what is life, we say the computers are dumb. So we don't know what the meaning of life is. This is how we look at it nowadays. Anything that you ask, you just go and, okay, let's get down to the net and see what it is. Look into yourself. You will know what is life. The basic principles, like the Tibetan, also Dr. Tenzing mentioned, that it revolves around the five two, uh, elements, uh, earth, air, water, la, earth, air, water, um, fire, and space. And then the three functional biological units, which is the Vat, Pitta, and the Kaf. Very similar, because Tibetan medicine has also come out of a lot of Ayurvedic principles. As I said, basic concepts. Again, another interesting concept of Ayurveda is Agni, which is the digestive capacity of individuals. And it's very important that we understand how the digestion is happening, because According to Ayurveda, it is the digestion which is the root cause of most ailments. I would say 80% of the ailments. And therefore, whenever I'm treating my patients, I would always see how the digestive ability of the person is, which is very important. So it all starts from there. I'm not going to the details of this. 
again there is a definite link between the agni the gut and the mind which we are all understanding now that if the digestion is not good the absorption is not good therefore the gut is not happy so the gut is not happy so the mind is not happy so there is a link between all this and we all know emotion always has a corresponding visceral response so sometimes when you say irritable bowel syndrome what is it it is because you are stressed you are anxious and that's how the gut is showing you're going you are having a, a innumerable number of bowels every day so this is how it is all linked another interesting aspect in ayurveda is prakriti which is the personality traits and everybody is born with that personality this doesn't change there are books which talk about prakriti and people normally refer oh i am this vata i am pitta i am this kapha but it is your present situation that you are in because it changes during the day it changes with your age the what pit and cuff balance and that's what is prakriti so prakriti is what you are born with and that is why people are somebody is tall somebody is short somebody is thin um fair dark long hair short hair thin hair rough hair all this it's genetically determined and this essential constitution remains unchanged during the children individual's lifetime again about prakriti i'll not go into the detail and 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 a very interesting concept this is daily regime which is your dinacharya what you do during the day and last year the nobel prize went on physiology for what circadian rhythm and you know how important it is to be with the circadian rhythm and to be in sync that will keep you healthy while genetic predisposition is there you can do nothing about it but then there are certain factors which are in your hand as dr gupta also said so you need to work on those so you have to be in sync with the natural cycle it's very important because there is also that doshic variation like for example early morning kapha is a little on the higher side then you have the pitta then you have the vata then again you know in the evening the same uh, set of principles happen so therefore you will have to be in sync with all this to remain as healthy as possible that's the definition of health in ayurveda we talk about samadosha samagni samdhatu malapriya prasanna atma indriya manaha that means your mind your indriyas and your soul they are all happy so that's very important and that's how i'm talking about why uh, mental disorders how they have to be addressed so that is a complete definition of health and even the who definition of health is some somewhat talking about everything now the health in ayurveda is basically talking about swasthavrit healthy lifestyle and regimen both and ethical conduct that's a definition of who i will not go into this uh, positive health and prevention of diseases is something that ayurveda has always been talking about uh, swastha se swasthya rakshanam that means building your immunity swastha se somebody who is healthy should remain healthy so how does he remain healthy by following as i said dinacharya and other lifestyle principles so that increases immunity and resistance and therefore you will not fall a prey to diseases uh, even if you fall a prey you will be able to cope with it and manage it in a better way uh this is interesting one must understand there are different routes of exposure to toxins in our body through air through water through soil <clears throat> sorry now these roots of exposures are through respiration through absorption through the skin and through ingestion but all them going to the liver being the main organ and then from there it presents itself in various symptoms with various features and that's something that i just thought i should share with you so we'll look at how to get rid of these uh, toxins so possible causes of mental illness there are innumerable causes innumerable you just cannot list them it may not be the same for everyone so i've just put them as biological psychological and environmental so these are the possible causes and so we have to understand what the cause is what is the causative factor 
this was very interesting if I looked at it World Health Organization and some of years of life lost to premature death now you can look at it if you look at the mental health part it's the highest so under 70 these are the number of years lost and mental health is topping the list this is something that I thought I must share with you since we are in Tibet house the Lai Lama Ji, His Holiness has always said, happiness is not something ready-made, it comes from your own actions. Um, quickly, let's look at some key facts. They are generally characterized by a combination of abnormal thoughts, perceptions, emotions, behavior, relationship issues and you know, many others. These are mental disorders. And they include depression, schizophrenia, other psychosis, dementia, intellectual disabilities, developmental disorders uh, like autism. So there are plenty of them. So uh, I'll not go deeper into that. Uh, the, there are strategies which are available for preventing mental disorders and their effective treatments. And it's not only the healthcare personnel or the physician who should be responsible. The social services should be capable of providing treatment and social support which is very important uh, stress dr gupta has already defined so i'm not going to that um, ayurveda perceives stress as an aggravation of vata as we were talking about vata pitta and cup so stress comes in vata uh, which has qualities of being light subtle erratic and sensitive and responsible for all nervous system activities uh, the broad principles of Ayurvedic treatment, uh, when we look at it, the first is the Nidan Parivarjan, removal of the causative factors. So as Dr. Gupta earlier mentioned, that alcohol, so unless you remove that, giving him treatment is symptomatic. You're just giving him medicine for a day, he has it, goes back, has again his share of alcohol, comes back, the medicine doesn't work, the doctor doesn't work. So the blame comes on the doctor, the blame comes on the medicine, but the point is Nidan Parivarjan is very important and Ayurveda lays a lot of emphasis on that. So if patients come to me for various reasons, I would say the Nidan is the first thing that one has to get rid of. Then comes the Sanshodhan, Shamshaman, Ahar, Achar, the lifestyle, everything comes, follows. But there are certain situations where the Nidan cannot, you cannot get rid of the Nidan. So in those situations, obviously, you will have to give the treatment. But if you can get rid of the Nidan, that is the way to treat a patient. Uh, again, a very interesting uh, quote. Happiness is when you think what you say and what you do are in harmony. That's from Mahatma Gandhiji. Self-discipline is very important and in all cases self-discipline is to be you know, given priority. So you should have a code of conduct and uh, to remain healthy both physically and mentally. Everything is a product of consistency. You cannot have a medicine today and say, okay, I should be doing fine tomorrow. No. And if you are told to lead a lifestyle, you need to say, this This is what the patients will ask you. Okay, have I to do it every day this? Why not? If it is a healthy thing, you need to do it every day. Make it a part of, make it a habit. Make it a part of your life. That's how it has to be. So consistency is very important. Don't look at very, you know, uh, fast uh, relief or something like that. Okay, I'll get the wild lady and I should be fine the next day. But stay consistent. I'm sorry, I'm learning 16 something. So. <laughs> Panchkarma, as I said, is something that some of you in this room would know that, okay, these are five purificatory measures. So you go to a retreat or you go to an Ayurvedic clinic, you take some treatments, some massage, some therapies, and that's Panchkarma. No, that's not Panchkarma. Although it is a part of Panchkarma, there's a whole lot of things that have to be done before you are even given those Panchkarma measures. So there are therapies that you need to undertake even before you are given the final or the main therapies. So what is that? You have to start from home, then you have to go there. Many cases I have seen panch karma doesn't work from home. So they have to get admitted, they have to be part of that retreat or the hospital where they are very closely monitored. 
I think Gangaram has a unit where um, one of my juniors is a doctor there and she works there. So you have to do it. You have to be very careful and very closely monitored. So then they'll do Panchkarma for 10 days. Oh, I have been detoxification. Okay, I am fine now. It doesn't work like that. So Panchkarma is basically hand-holding to change your behavior to better behaviors. So changing those habits, it, you know, old habits die hard. So you have to work hard on that. And Panchkarma does help. There was a study done in US where they assist the people after giving Panchkarma and then they saw that these methods were very much helpful in changing the behavior of people to healthy behavioral lifestyles. There are different ways of uh, pacification measures also, which include langhan, which is starvation, you know, fasting, again, something which is now picking up very fast. So if you fast 20 days in a year, you live a healthy life. But then, okay, you have to fast 20 days, but that doesn't mean you'll do whatever you want on the other days. So that control has to be there. Then there are ways to give treatment through exercise, through digestive, uh, you know, stimulating uh, biochemical processes. Then there is a replenishment therapy, so a whole lot of, and then the diet, effect of diet and food on body functions. This is also very important in Ayurveda, we have, we give a lot of importance to diet and uh, digestion. Um, physical exercise we have already discussed, so I'm not going to then. Meditation, now uh, quickly I'll go through some studies which um, I can share with you. Meditation associated with structural changes in brain. So this was a study done in Massachusetts and it was seen that um, even after meditation was stopped, there were structural changes in the brain. So meditation is that strong. Rasayan, as I said, is one of the main uh, principles of uh, treatment in Ayurveda and we always resort to that. And Rasayan is achieved through various ways. Um, you could relate it to adaptogen, to an immunostimulant or a pro-host probiotic, anti-mutagenic, lots of ways to define it, you know, 21st century uh, definition if you want. Now there are different types of rasayan, Kamya rasayan, for mental health we have Medhya rasayan, Medha badane ke liye, Pran Kamya for vitality and longevity. Then you have Nimitic rasayan which is very specific targeting the disease. Then you have Achar rasayan, good moral conduct. So rasayan doesn't mean only ki chavan parash khaliya and uh, only the, you know, following certain things. There are different sets of rasayans mentioned in Ayurveda and we follow that. Antioxidants is another, you know, uh, not a recent one, but then we look at it now that there are lots of uh, ways that we can improve antioxidants in our body so that, you know, oxidative stress can be reduced. Stress management techniques, that there are various ways to manage stress. Now, I'm not going into depression and anxiety and all that, all that, but, you know, there are uh, techniques. You should have sufficient sleep. We are all lacking in sleep. Nobody gets about six to eight hours of good sleep. Everybody is lacking. Sleep at two o'clock in the morning, wake up at seven o'clock, rush to the office. I mean, if you calculate a 24 hours a day, you will see how much time you're spending on a good quality sleep, which is very important. Fresh air, pure. How many of we go for a walk in the park? Not many. Um, develop a sense of humor. Deal with emotions constructively. Develop meaningful relationships. Enjoy nature, enjoy your favorite recreation, give your life a purpose and meaning that you want to do this. There are ways to de-stress. Learn time management delegation techniques. Don't think that you can do everything. And if you're not there, things won't be done. No, let's not become a perfectionist. Let others do it for you. Pamper yourself, enjoy yourself. Be light-hearted moments. Practice deep breathing and relaxation techniques. Um, just quickly, another one minute. Yeah. Uh, some facts, best-selling drugs of today are, you know, obesity, type 2 diabetes. So when you are in a dysfunctional state, you go for a treatment. Now that's another Tibetan proverb. The secret to living long, well, is eat half, walk double, laugh triple, and love without measure. This you must see, integration of diet, nutrition and lifestyle. 23,000 people were studied for adherence to four simple behaviors. 
Just four simple behaviors. And what about those? No smoking, exercising three and a half hours per week, healthy diet, healthy weight, a BMI less than 30. So what happens? In those adhering to these four simple behaviors, what happened? 93% of diabetes, 81% of heart attacks, 50% of strokes, and 36% of all cancers were prevented. And I'm giving you from where I've taken up this article. Uh, this was in uh, general. So, thank you. And, and, and before, before, I, before I conclude, I must share this with you. I love this message. A child asked God, if everything is already written in destiny, then why should I wish? So the God smiled and said, Maybe on some pages I've written as you wish. <laughs> so therefore you have blank sheets. Please write your life. May I invite the other two speakers up, please? Oh yeah, question and answers. Yes. The floor is open for question and answers. We have about 10 minutes so that you all don't miss your tea. Not so much a question, but how can we access the presentation? <laughs> Anybody can, all of you can take that. <laughs> I think the Tibet House would have it on their net and you would have it on your website. The presentations, you can email them, so you can give your email ID and they will. Yes, Tibet House is very kindly offered to email the presentations to all those who are interested. Thank you. I'm a bit confused, so that's why the question is hard to clarify. No comments, just a quick question. Half of the world thinks that there is reincarnation and half of the world thinks there is no reincarnation. Half of the world's religions say about a reincarnation, reincarnation. and others don't say. Uh, two third are like two medical systems say that there is Vat, Pit, Kaf. You used a different terminology for that. but. As a uh, modern medicine uh, doctor, you didn't mention that about. So, which one is correct? Like, are you correct or are you correct? We are all correct. <laughs> I'm talking from Ayurvedic perspective. Dr. Tenzing spoke from uh, Tibetan perspective, and that's the modern perspective. I so, what to believe is you are all are correct, and some, but something, something is missing that makes you no medicine is complete in itself, actually. I'll say, actually. Right? All these, the point is not which is the best, actually. Okay, which is the most correct. We need all of these, actually. As I told you, three kind of this thing, disease science, health science, ultimate science. Which one we need? I think all three I need. When I deceased, it is to be treated actually. To remain healthy, I need a health science. And to reach my ultimate goal, I need ultimate science. So as the human intelligence discovers a new and new facet of life, I think it's adding on to our life. But don't forget the past knowledge actually. See, it's exactly like, I, I'm just, it's exactly like you get confused when you get so many Mobile phones in the market, Mobile. you get confused, yeah. but then you decide that this is the best one for me. Similarly, you need to understand these are all sciences and they are complete sciences and uh, you know, uh, well uh, stood the test of the time. So therefore you need to understand that and I'll be very frank with you, with you because I've been practicing for nearly three and a half decades now and Dr. Gupta has also been practicing or fencing also. I mean, uh, I understand my limitations of Ayurveda and then I say, okay, you need to go and see an allopathic doctor. If an antibiotic is needed, an antibiotic is needed. But if it is not, I will not, you know, just go on prescribing something which I'm not uh, authorized to. So therefore I don't. But then I also know my limitations and I will refer my patient. So that is something we all need to understand. 
Yeah, is schizophrenia curable? Like somebody has hearing voices, delusions, and uh, uh, you know, conspiracy, persecution theories. Is schizophrenia uh, curable through Ayurveda or any other way than allopathy? You want to answer Dr. Schizophrenia then I'll answer. Uh, in allopathy medicine, actually, schizophrenia, there are drugs, actually and uh, electrical therapy and other modes of therapy which are used to control schizophrenia whether all of them will get corrected we cannot say actually because in allopathy they are uh, i will not say i'm a mental health expert actually neither i'm a psychiatrist i'm just telling general perspective okay, there are many kinds of schizophrenia actually some of them will respond to treatment some of them will respond partially and some of them are very resistant actually uh, my, uh, can, can, can I? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, the, in illnesses like schizophrenia, there's also multiple causes and conditions. So it's a little difficult to just give a yes or a no. It depends on several causes and conditions in addition to treatment factors and other supportive factors in the environment. Okay, but you have to take allopathy medicine if somebody has schizophrenia. Is it a must to take allopathy medicine? Again, it's difficult to answer in absolutes in all honesty because what experience has shown is that uh, different clients respond in different ways and it would depend on what stage of the treatment they're in. So it would be very difficult to make a generalization in terms of, yes, this. But we have definitely seen medication has been helpful with symptoms where there is um, a certain kind of orientation to reality and so on and so forth. But having said that, that it's difficult to make an uh, absolute generalized comment on yes or no. I battled with schizophrenia for many years and uh, I was on uh, you know uh, allopathy medicine but I stopped allopathy in 2013. Since then I am doing and I research on my own illness on my mind and body and I've tried so many things naturopathy you know, meditations, yoga, pranam, everything, everything that a person can think of. And I have improved a lot. There's so much work still to be done. And I have stopped. I don't trust allopathy anymore because the devastating effect that allopathy had on me is too much. It's, it's too much. So, so um, I don't know. I, uh, this. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing. And I'm glad you're doing better. Yeah. Can I ask a question? I want to ask a question to the panel. I thank you for the wisdom you have shown before us. The panel is very expert. My question is, is a child with mild autism curable? Because these days we are seeing the aggravation of autism in the society. So since you all are from a very expert area, so my direct question is, is a person with a child with mild autism curable? Uh, autism itself is a spectrum of disorder. Right? Okay. It's not a single disease, I believe. Okay. And after now we use the term autistic spectrum disorder, ASD, okay. actually. And many of these are correctable, like right. not all of them. Is that pardon? Many of these are correctable, actually. Correctable. Mm -hmm. Provided we follow therapy and the treatments. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for the uh, session. I my question is to uh, Dr. Deepika. Uh, uh, when, whenever we are referring to any text, like let's say, uh, so there is a time-based wisdom and a timeless wisdom in that. So are there any uh, are there any treatments in Ayurveda which are now obsolete, which were there once, you know, uh, suitable in that? Uh, union the goes. union goes. and second is that uh, to the uh, uh, Tibetan doc uh, Dr. Tenzin, uh, like it's both of you that what is a thin line of difference between the Ayurvedic and the Tibetan? If that removed, will fall and collapse into one. So I think that no, it can't because the whole philosophy is different. Yeah. But yeah, you I use the yeah. words that Tibetan medicine came out through the yeah, yeah, because yeah. Tibetan medicine came later. Ayurveda yeah, 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 yeah. Is that that is uh, so. Actually, uh, I told you before. Uh, Tibetan medicine is integrated with Buddhist philosophies. Yes. So that is the basic uh, difference between the Ayurveda and Tibetan medicine. So we have a lot of uh, philosophies from the Buddhism, you know, the mind and the energy. Everything comes from Buddhist philosophies. 
That is, I think, the basic uh, fundamental difference. See, influence of Chinese, Indian, and Buddhism comes in Tibetan medicine. So Aripa. It's called So Aripa. Right? So all that influence is there in Tibetan medicine. Ayurveda is on its own a system, traditional system of medicine from Indian subcontinent and it has got 5,000 years history. And what was then, as I said, there were things that were mentioned then which are now, some of them are obsolete, for example, surgery. I don't know uh, if there are any surgeons sitting here, Dr. Gupta would know. Shushud was known as the father of ancient uh, Indian surgery. He was the first one to do the rhinoplasty operation, the nasal operation. So therefore surgery was there. But then what happened? Now where are we in surgery? We are having robotic surgery now. So we can't even compete on that. But there are medicines. Again with medicines there is an issue. There were plants which were available which are not available now. They become endangered. So there are issues, but then the system as it is stayed on. And the principles of the system stayed on. And that's why today even the West is looking at Ayurveda. I practiced for uh, more than a decade in uh, London and I'll tell you, people are willing to look at it. And I sh just shared that there's going to be a research work happening just to get rid of the antibiotics and which has been, you know, the GPs are using in common cold and uh, flu. So they just want to use an Ayurvedic uh, herb which is known as Andrographis paniculata. And uh, clinical research has been planned for that. So there are things happening. So, haldi, turmeric is a marvelous uh, thing now. The West is having, you know, there was uh, turmeric latte. Have you ever heard of it? haldi ka dood bolte in India mein usko. And that's turmeric latte in uh, London street. So you can imagine lots of things are being taken, but just because it's been given that word, turmeric latte, that sounds better, yeah. Haldi ka dood kon <laughs> you know, So it's a new nomenclature. It's an old wine in a new bottle. That's what is happening. एक क्वेश्चन करना चाहें क्या बैठ आप लोग सब डॉक्टर बैठे हैं यहाँ पे क्या कभी ऐसी स्थिति भी आती है डॉक्टर पेशेंट को कह देता है कि आवाने की आपको जरूरत नहीं है ठीक हो गए जब मैं कहीं उदाहरण है कि मेरी बुआ थी इनके तीन लड़कियाँ थी दूसरा एक ट्राई के लड़के के लिए चौथा बच्चा और ट्विंस हो गए चार लड़कियों की आज उन लड़कियों की लड़की की भी शादी हो गई है लेकिन वो बेचारे अभी भी टेंशन की दवाई ले रही हैं मेरा खुद का लड़का था एडीएसडी करके उन्होंने किया था उसकी दवाई चालू की चौदह किलो से सत्ताईस किलो पहुँच गया उसका दवाई खा खा एलोपैथी फिर हम होम्योपैथी पर आ गए हमने दवाई छोड़ दी आज बच्चा वो लाख लो कर रहा है कोई दिक्कत नहीं है मैं अगर जैसे शुगर की दवाई लेते हैं मैं उसके देखता हूँ टेस्टिंग स्टेप लेके आते हैं हर बार उसमें मेजरमेंट अलग लिखे होते हैं तो ऐसी स्थिति आती है कि जो हमें ऐसा लगता है कि जितनी हम कोई डॉक्टर छोड़ता नहीं परमानेंट सी चाहिए होती है उसको भी पेशेंट की क्या ऐसा कुछ है क्या मतलब हम सोच सकते हैं कि हम डॉक्टर के पास जा रहे हैं तो जैसे मैंने डॉक्टर के पास गया कोई वो तो कहते हैं आपको पास डिसऑर्डर कौन सा होता है बायोपोलर डिसऑर्डर है वो कहता है डॉक्टर से आपने ज़्यादा बात कर ली होगी इसलिए उसने उतनी ज़्यादा दवाई बढ़ाता रहेगा जितना कम बोलोगे डॉक्टर से उतना आप सही रहोगे ऐसा कुछ है क्या I think all this is a reflection of the society of Elsel. All this is a reflection of the society as human to human relation is deteriorating. Same way doctor to patient relation is deteriorating. And I will not say the patient is at fault or doctor is at fault. Society as a whole, the way it is going ahead is putting a mistrust. I mean, there is a person-to-person -person interaction, actually. And whatever mistrust is there, actually, is just a reflection of that. I mean, all this for example, which I have given, all are true. I will find a doctor say that you are not supposed to come. I don't know. That they, it's very difficult to generalize any statement anywhere, actually. Right. Your individual, a single experience doesn't make it a generalization. Well, if you ask me, I don't want to see my patients very frequently. <laughs> if they come to me and they are okay for six months, one year, I'm very happy. And when they come back, I said, why have you come? Well, just to come and see you. That's it. Not for anything. Just to come and see you. This is their answer. So you can understand there are, I mean, I'm not saying it's me only. There are plenty of doctors like me who would give the genuine treatment and tell the patient, no, you're fine. You're doing fine. Carry on. You may have to have this for three months. Then stop it. And then if there is a need, you come back and we will review the case. It's like that. 
Maybe we'll take that up during tea. <laughs> because we, um, first of all, just deep, deep gratitude for this panel. Besides the tremendous experience and wisdom that they have brought here today to share with each of us, I think what we all should perhaps take away is how three people from such diverse perspectives can sit at one panel and really engage in dialogue and conversation. There is no such thing as me first, my theory first, none of that. And that um, attitude is so um, wonderful to observe and watch in practice to have three of you embody that uh, is a tremendous learning and I'm sure all of you will agree as well. For any further questions, please uh, feel free to carry them on during tea. Um, we'll let you go now uh, with deep gratitude for being here. Thank you. Oh. I'm sorry, we have to also, yes. So uh, thank you. Uh, the session is over now. I would request uh, Mr. Naresh Mathur to come and present the uh, souvenir and khada to uh, our chairperson, Dr. Uh, Nivedita uh, Chalid, right? Yeah. <laughs> Now next uh, to the speakers, uh, Dr. Naresh Gupta. Uh, Suresh Gupta, sorry. sorry. <laughs> Ground floor, right? It's in the back, uh, the, the adjacent room. Kindly please join us there. Thank you.